Rogues Gallery Uncovered Bad Behaviour in Period Costume An unashamed rummage into the lives of history's greatest libertines, lotharios and complete bastards. This podcast contains adult themes and a little bit of colourful language. Those of a sensitive disposition might wish to listen from an adjoining room. Unlawful, unpleasant and unclean. Medieval England's most diseased criminal always keeps his hands in his pockets with Adam the Leper. The following tale is written in the present tense of the period in which it's set and as such might contain attitudes and opinions of the protagonists and their times which would today be considered unacceptable. In this case, almost medieval. They're not necessarily mine. England, 1348. So you say you were robbed by Adam the Leper. Can you describe him to me? About average height, one of his men called him Adam. Anything else? He had leprosy. Well, that certainly sounds like him, all right. You've had a narrow escape, my friend. Adam and his not-so-merry men have been terrorising the South East well, for the best part of ten years now, and a right brutal gang of thieving bastards they are too, if you'll pardon my Latin. You and your companions must have been a particularly rich prize, as these days they don't tend to lurk around at the side of the road like common brigands. Adam and his gang's speciality is robbing whole towns. He's probably robbed yours, if you did but know it. It's always the same. They turn up on market day or when there's a fair on. The streets are full of peddlers and visitors from out of town, you see, and everybody's busy and excited. I love a good fair. Acrobats and sword swallowers, rope walkers, dancing bears, minstrels having a sing-song. Lovely. And wrestling contests too. I used to win a fair few of those in my day, I can tell you. You know, with everybody miserable about war with the French and raging pestilence or wondering if there'll be another famine this year, it's still nice to have something to look forward to. Of course, you've still got to be careful, as the streets will also be full of cut purses who'll whip the coin from your belt while you're standing around drooling over a meat pie. And it's not just thieves, you could even be fleeced by the people you're supposed to be buying from. How many times do you think you've bought a few pounds of grain from some friendly stallholder, but because the scales have been rigged or the weights were false, you ended up getting a lot less than you paid for? More times than you imagine, I'll be bound. If you're lucky though, you might see what honest townsfolk do to a cheating merchant if they catch them. They stick them in the pillory, that's what, and pelt the cheating bastards with rotten vegetables or fish. Or worse. And by worse, I mean they bombard them with handfuls of shit. And it serves them right. Kiddies though, they love it. Fairs, of course, can go on for days and everybody gets drunk and young men and young ladies do what they will. I used to do a fair bit of that as well. Whoa. What I'm trying to say is that while all this fun's going on, nobody's paying any attention to their valuables and that's what Adam is banking on. Amidst all the jollity, you see, his boys are innocently mingling with the crowd, carefully watching who's coming and going. You know, apart from Adam himself, of course, who's probably standing on his own on account of him, you know, being leprous. When the gang are sure that most of the townspeople are out enjoying themselves, they slip away from the festivities, break into their houses, rob them blind and then set them on fire. In all the hue and cry, they fade away into the smoke and the townspeople don't know what's been filched or what's been consumed by the flames. You've almost got to admire their cleverness. I tell you, I'm in the wrong game. To be honest, you're lucky to be standing here at all. Adam's lot are also famous around here for kidnapping. A bag over your head, a knife at your throat and poof. One minute you're admiring a nice new frying pan you've just bought and the next you're off into the woods before anybody realises that you've gone. Before they've even had a chance to miss you, your family gets a message that unless they stump up a big bag of gold or silver by way of ransom, they'll find your body hanging in pieces from a tree. And even if they do pay, the chances are that Adam would have cut you up a bit before letting you go, just for sport. You'd think, being a leper, you'd have more important things to think about than wanton cruelty. I suppose, since the Great Pestilence, people aren't so kindly disposed towards the contagiously ill, I mean, they used to give them arms and build hospitals to house them in. Now they just run a mile. Nobody's safe these days, not even officials going about the king's business. Adam's particularly fond of robbing them, just to show how little he respects the law. You know, the Prince of Wales once sent some of his servants off to the market to buy some food. And they came back from an unexpected meeting with Adam, beaten to a pulp with not a penny on them. You know, he'd even pinched their horse and cart. He's got some cods though, it's a brave man who robs from the king. Have you ever heard of Richard Puddlecut? 
He was a cheese merchant who tunnelled into the crypt of Westminster Abbey back in 03 and made off with £100,000 worth of gold and silver. Now, you'd think that'd be enough for any man, but oh no, the silly bastard, pardon my Flemish, spent the next two days getting royally pissed before tunnelling back in with some of his mates to steal another load. It was only when clerical valuables started turning up in pawn shops and brothels and fishermen's nets that the Abbey monks finally realised that they'd been robbed. It was said, you know, that Puddlecut was in cahoots with some of the monks, although he claimed at his trial that he'd been working alone. They did find a few of the stolen items, though, hidden in the monks' rooms, which, to a professional like me, is a sure sign of guilt. Of course, the monks, being monks, claimed the benefit of the clergy, so they got off scot-free. Puddlecut, though, wasn't so lucky. He was hanged and his skin nailed to the abbey door as a warning to others. Now that's more like it. These days, they call rotting bodies swinging from a gibbet or a shriveled head stuck on a pole a deterrent. I reckon we're going soft. Sorry, I got distracted there for a minute. We were talking about Adam the Leper. Did you hear how last year he pretty much robbed the entire town of Bristol? That's right, he and his men seized the whole port, ships and all. Then he set himself up as king of the town and gave his men license to rob, rape, burn and defile anything they fancied. Some of the ships had just sailed in from Spain and the lads on deck hardly had time to furl their sails before they were boarded by a bunch of drunk savages and had their holds stripped bare. Among the vessels he plundered were some conducting King Edward's personal business and he's a fellow with a hell of a temper. You remember what he did to the French at Cressy. Somehow though, Adam managed to avoid royal retribution. Perhaps his majesty was too busy with all that war and pestilence we were talking about to pay much attention. The final straw, though, came later, when Adam committed the unforgivable sin of robbing the king's wife. Philippa of Hainol, that's her name, owned a lot of expensive jewellery, some of which she'd given to a merchant in London for safekeeping. Now, that was a wise precaution. You don't want to go roaming the country with a, a chest full of valuables on the back of your carriage, attracting footpads like a corpse attracts crows. Trouble was, Adam found out about the jewels and where they were being kept. His men laid siege to the poor merchant's house one night and demanded that he hand them over. The merchant was a braver or more stupid man than I. Armed only with a cudgel, he stood resolutely in his doorway and cracked their heads as they tried to get in, all the while damning their impudence. Adam was impressed with the man's courage, but that didn't stop him from setting his house on fire. His gang refused to allow anybody to escape until the merchant had thrown down the jewels. Well, what would you do? Let your family burn? or cough up the sparklers. Exactly. The king's fury, though, was terrifying to behold. He sent forth Lord Barclay and a troop of armed men with strict instructions to tear the countryside apart until they found and punished this scabrous outlaw. I often wonder, though, why Adam didn't take himself off to a church and claim the privilege of sanctuary. As I'm sure you're aware, if the law's after you, you can go to any holy place, and once inside, they can't touch you, for 40 days at least. Sometimes I hear that Westminster Abbey is so full of criminals on the run, there's hardly any room left in there for the people who are trying to pray. Talking of churches, that reminds me, old Martin the Hermit once told me this great story about the Folvilles. Have you heard of them? They were a family of outlaws led by John Folville and his seven sons, who robbed and murdered anybody they felt like back in the 20s and 30s. It all started to go wrong from them about eight years ago, when they kidnapped a royal judge called Sir Richard Willoughby. The law came down on them and hard. So they ran to a village called T and claimed sanctuary at the local church. It turns out that Richard Folville, one of the brothers, had been the rector there for nearly 20 years. It's like I was saying, you can't always trust the clergy. At first, the Folvilles kept their pursuers at bay by shooting arrows at them from the church windows. Several fell dead among the headstones, stuck like hedgehogs. Seeing his men getting turned into pincushions, combined with the king's most emphatic order though, gave a furious Barclay all the inspiration he needed to ignore the rules of privilege and make a full-on assault. His men burst into the chancel, dragged Richard into the churchyard by his cassock and chopped his head off. No messing about. Those left standing after the attack were then arrested. And did those brave constables get a reward or even a nod of recognition for their brave deeds? The Pope ordained that for killing a priest, one who robbed, murdered and raped, mind you, the men who executed him should serve a penance to atone for their sin. This involved being publicly whipped at every church in the area. It makes you wonder why they bothered, it really does. Sorry, I became distracted. We were talking about Adam the leper. 
They captured Adam at Winchester, you know, and I would have thought he was for the noose, the axe, or even the stake. But would you believe it? He got off. And it wasn't for the usual reason that he bribed the judge to let him go. You'd be surprised at how lenient they can be when you cross their palms. Nor was it that he offered threats of violence. I tell you, I've seen a judge about to deliver a guilty verdict one minute, get a knife pulled on in the next, and suddenly decide that the accused has got no case to answer. No, no, it was Adam's gang that did it. They stood outside the courthouse and savagely attacked anybody who came in or out. In the end, the trial couldn't go ahead because nobody could get close enough to the judge's bench, so they had to let Adam go. It's all about jurisprudence, you see. I blame Magna Carta. They should have stuck with trial by hot iron. You knew where you were with that. Pick a red-hot bar of iron out of a blazing fire and walk with it in your hand for nine feet. If three days later your hand shows no sign of healing, then you're guilty and you hang. Simple. I don't know what this country's coming to, I really don't. So the best thing you can do is leave me your details and we'll get back to you if there's any news. Oh, you've gone. Where's my bloody purse? History doesn't record what happened to Adam the leper, although, going on his name, we can take a pretty good guess. If you want to discover more about the medieval criminal underworld, you'll find some reading suggestions in the show notes of this episode. Next time, Diary of a Masturbator. How a famous diarist hid his seedy secrets in code. With Samuel Pepys. Before you go, I'd love to hear what you think about the podcast so far, and if you've got any suggestions for badly behaved historical figures to feature, it'd be brilliant if you could let me know. Visit roguesgalleryuncovered.com and drop me a line, and while you're there, you could sign up to the newsletter and become a lovable rogue. That's all for today. I'll see you yesterday. <laughs>